Hello there. Thank you very much for joining me for this talk, The Soft Side of DevOps is Hard, which is about people stuff. You know, we, uh, we're very comfortable with machines, with technology, but people, that's, a, that's quite a different topic. I would have liked to have been with you in person as I was a couple of years ago. This photo here of me on stage was from 2018. Had great fun then. Um, but I guess, you know, with social distancing, we'll just have to do it at a distance. Uh, you'll see my contact details bottom left on the screen. Please feel free to get in touch with me. Link up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm fairly active on Twitter and LinkedIn if you'd like to follow my stuff. Anyway, let's get on with the uh, let's get on with the talk. Um, as I as I mentioned, it would be really great to have seen you in person, like a couple of years ago. Maybe you can recognise yourself here somewhere. But uh, hopefully, we'll see each other um, before too long in uh, in person. Now, I have a question for you. A couple of questions, in fact. Although we're at a distance, how are you feeling? Uh, two questions for you to think about. Firstly, what's your energy level at the moment? Um, have you eat eaten recently, for instance? That usually affects your energy level. Did you sleep well? And the second question is, are you feeling positive or negative? Have I said anything to annoy you already? Because how you feel will influence how you participate passively uh, mostly in this uh, in this talk what uh, you know what you get out of it um, and it's a great little exercise you could consider doing at work as well starting a meeting just by you know recognizing people's humanity you know, everybody is a, an individual and sometimes you have a bad day or just recognize that so make this uh, make you could make this a, a bit of a routine just to check in with people's feelings at the uh, at the start of a meeting because this is about people now the the talk you can summarize it's, it's rather depressing this really when you think about it life's a struggle people are weird behavior is unpredictable and you'll never master it anyway so that's um, a bit depressing but anyway we're going to give it a go see how far we get starting with life is a struggle I think just this is one, I think this is a great cartoon ages ago, one of life's little struggles. Liz, uh, I think you like that computer more than you like me. That's not true, Liz. I do not like that computer more than I like you. Please, please don't ask about the laptop. That computer? You know, people are so, uh, so difficult to deal with. Um, but this is just life, so we've got to get on with it. But people, you know, people are, are weird. We are strange, we are strange beings. Um, we are meaning-seeking beings to start with, although the world is intrinsically meaningless. You know, a, a mountain, a tree, a lake, they don't have meanings. But as people, we want, to, we want to see a meaning in something. Um, that's, our, that's our survival mechanism, to, to, to survive a meaningless, a meaningless world. world. And I, I came across something that is my survival technique. I, I got it from the Dalai Lama. He said the meaning of life is, um, is happiness and usefulness. I thought that's, uh, that, makes, that makes sense to me. And I've adopted happiness and usefulness as, um, I won't say my religion, but certainly as guiding principles. And I don't aim for happiness directly, I aim for usefulness. Usefulness is something that makes me happy. At least that's what I've told myself is the meaning of life. So we're not only meaning-seeking beings, we're also belonging-seeking beings. We like a sense of identity to belong to a group, to identify with the symbols, the artifacts, the rituals, behavior, beliefs that a group has. Uh, artifacts like, you know, you, you might be wearing a t-shirt if you're in the DevOps industry. Lots of people do. That's one of the artifacts, even possibly a symbol. Um, rituals, uh, a daily stand-up, for instance, you might have developed that ritual. That is something that you do in your kind of group, your kind of people. And you have beliefs about, uh, about things and about people. 
Um, and these beliefs are quite interesting because you, you sometimes you, you develop stories about other people, uh, about other groups or other individuals, even at a, um, at a personal relationship uh, level. Uh, if you have a partner, you have a story about your partner. You're, it's interesting, you're not actually interacting with your partner most of the time, you're interacting with your story about the partner. And you, so you've got to, got to make sure that you've got the right story and that you sometimes edit the story from time to time to make sure that it's, it's synchronized with reality. So that's a, that's a fascinating thing to think about, the kind of stories that you tell yourself about other people and, and indeed tell yourself about yourself. Uh, you have a story about yourself. Uh, this thing about them and us, this, this brings us on to one of life's paradoxes as far as I'm concerned, because although we're more comfortable hanging out with our kind of people, you know, people like us do things like this, our kind of community, um, and we don't like those strangers, you know, those, those other people, uh, they're weird. Uh, but although we like hanging out with us, our own kind of people, we need those strangers to survive for the longer term. Because if you just stick, stick to the same group, you'll get, you'll get inbreeding, and that will lead to extinction. So you have to breed, cross-pollinate with strangers in order to survive on the longer term. So that's, uh, that's quite an interesting thing, that, that need to collaborate, even though it's sometimes a bit painful. But hey, life is suffering. Came across a couple of great quotes that I'd like to share with you. Um, Human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished. Human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they've been finished. It really is human nature to think that you, know, you are as you are and that's it and that you won't change. But if you look back five years, ten years, in fact, who you are now isn't like who you are then. So you are constantly changing. Uh, Ralph Emerson, uh, Waldo Emerson said it um, a long time earlier. He said, people wish to be settled. People have the need for certainty. So they like to, like to sort of be where they are, not move much. Um, but he says, only as far as they are unsettled, is there any hope for them? So people do have to change. We do have to change in order to survive and prosper in the future. So I think that's interesting. Uh, Thing to think about. And finally, the um, people are weird. We are fixated on quick fixes. We love the quick fix, even if it's the wrong answer. If it's a simple answer, that is very tempting. We could be seduced into taking the, the simple but wrong answer. Although you've taken the trouble to, um, to attend this talk, to think about things, maybe you're going for the complex but right answer. But it is scary how many people want, want to go for the quick uh, uh, the quick fix. So that was a bit about the characteristics about people. People are weird. Um, it doesn't get much better with behavior. Behavior is pretty unpredictable. Now, if you're really, this is a bit of a sidetrack, but this is, this is fa absolutely fascinating. I came across this guy, Professor Robert Sapolsky, uh, teaches, uh, I don't think he teaches anymore, at uh, Stanford University. I think he's retired from that position, but he's um, fabulous. Uh, he gives a fabulous series of lectures, and I've, I've watched them all. I started watching one, and I ended up watching 40 hours of lectures on YouTube, freely available. Human behavior biology about how your behavior uh, comes, up, comes about, what happened in your brain, how um, some sensory influence in the environment uh, something you smelt, for instance, influenced you. The um, uh, your your genes for your or your hormones, how they've influenced you. What happened during your adolescence when your prefrontal -front cortex was was developing? You know, that's a bit of the brain that, uh, that that controls your impulses. What happened during uh, your mother's pregnancy, because that has an effect on your behaviour as well, all well, indirectly, of course and back to the culture that you came from and the, the whole evolution of your, of your species. Really fascinating, puts, puts things in, uh, in, a, in a completely different um, perspective. Thoroughly recommend that you take a look even at just a little bit of what he, what he talks about. That's great stuff. Oh, 
uh, behavior theory and, and some facts. Um, good definition of, be, of, of behavior that it is determined by stimuli, both external stimuli, things, things that happen outside your body, but also in your body, uh, hormones, for instance, that you're not directly aware of. And it's also influenced by um, uh, emotions and reasoning that you have in emotion and reasoning that they're formed by, by both um, nurture and nature. So you know, nature, what you were born with, and, um, and nurture, how, um, how you were formed by, by experience. So that's, um, that's a bit of a definition of behavior. But if you, if you observe behavior, you notice that it's unpredictable. And influenced by lots of stuff, by the shortcuts, the heuristics that people take, the biases that we have, it's just natural to have biases, the stories we tell ourselves, they all influence behavior. And another fact that's quite interesting is that, and uh, quite relevant, is that uh, the consequences of actions have more effect on behavior than the warnings. That, for instance, if you're, if you're driving a car, the, the uh, sign with the 100 kilometers an hour speed, maximum speed, that will influence you less than a fine that you get if you get caught speeding. Consequences are much more important than, than the warnings. So that's a good thing to, to bear in mind about, uh, about behavior. Behavior is very much about motivation, what motivates you to actually, uh, actually behave in a certain way. Um, I, I say motivation is a function of the abilities that you have. Do you feel able to do something? Uh, your opinions about things, what you, the stories you tell yourself about stuff, and the desires that you have, particularly the desires, the inner desires you have to, to change. Uh, recently, I drew, drew this picture. I started off with love and desire as mutually exclusive uh, domains. Uh, you love what you have and you desire what you don't have. It's a crucial difference between the two. And I got thinking about, um, about where need fits into this, uh, what you need, not what you want, not what you decide, but what you need, that there's, um, you can draw a nice little Venn diagram on that. And this is, this is possibly the only part of the talk that's directly related to, to DevOps, because you could easily plot DevOps on that. Uh, development is about what you want, uh, operations is about what you have and you could say that QA is about uh, about what you need the, the quality of um, quality of IT I thought that was a nice little way of, uh, of thinking or well, thinking about life in general in fact now I wrote a book recently um, I even had a t-shirt made with the with a picture of the book and you see the see the book on the, on my bookshelf behind me and I wrote a book about a book that's the book I'm holding there on that um, on that picture. It's a, it's a weird book. It's an idle book, which you might associate with uh, with processes and stuff like that. Fairly old fashioned, but idle's changed a lot. And I think this is the weirdest book that um, that that, that Axelos, the publishers, of the owners of idle, have ever published. Uh, lots of people say it's a strange book, and I'm quite pleased with that. Now, in the, when I was writing that book, I came up with um, what I called five aspirational behavior patterns, which I think are things that people like us uh, want to do, our desires. We want to help get customers' jobs done, we want the satisfaction, satisfaction of helping somebody, at least I do. We want to be trusted and trust other people in the workplace, which is something that not always happens. We recognize that things are ambiguous, are uncertain, are complex in nature. Uh, we want to, we're not uh, satisfied with, with the status quo. We, we're continually raising the bar, learning and experiencing and improving all the way. And we want to do the ethically right thing. And if you're interested in, in a bit about that book, I, I'm publishing on a weekly basis free excerpts of the book. In, uh, on a LinkedIn article called Here I Wrote This. You can find that easily enough. And if you can't, just send me a note and I'll send you the link. Now, it's interesting with these, um, these aspirations. Um, you might have come across the, the book, The Unicorn Project, which is the sequel to The Phoenix Project, which you probably will have heard of. And Gene Kim came up with what he calls five ideals 
in the unicorn project and these these and we we wrote our books in parallel didn't talk to each other about them but we we seem to come up with pretty similar things and i don't want to go into the content of the comparison but just point out that we are in two different uh, domains uh, two different people were thinking about more or less the same same kind of stuff so i thought that was uh, that was interesting um a couple of examples of uh, of some of these things um helping <coughs> getting customers jobs done and the role of empathy in helping getting customers jobs done now what i've depicted here is uh, somebody weird in it obviously and a, a boring business person in blue doing a, having a service interaction doing things together um, the service provider and the service consumer those two two roles that we distinguish in service and the the, the business person the, their primary need is what do i need to get my job done what information do i need what next step do i need taken so thinking in terms of output and outcome and the distinction between the two is important um, if i were to cut your hair for instance that's a service interaction i'll cut your hair i can cut your hair perfectly just as long as you like it like this the output of the hair cutting would be the haircut the outcome of the haircut well what do you want to achieve with a with with a haircut probably want to feel good so that's the outcome and it's important to distinguish between the two output is usually pretty technical and outcome is what people the benefit that they uh, people derive from it so that means that the service provider has to have cognitive empathy i'm going to show you two different kinds of empathy the first one is cognitive empathy which is about understanding where the customer is in the customer journey uh, what kind of needs that they typically have what questions have other people asked in the past trying to anticipate the next move suggesting things giving them help on the way very much a cognitive uh, analytical process um, based on where the where the customer is but now you get and go moving on to the onto the the more experiential stuff um, the consumer gets a certain experience out of the interaction and that you could say that's about uh, their emotional state and their social state how do i feel that's my emotional state what do others think of me that's my social state now do people what, what do people think about the new smartphone i bought that's the social state and that affects how you think about yourself depending on depending on how much attention you pay to other people and even the output and the outcome will have an effect on your experience if it's a lousy haircut you know you won't you won't feel good and if you if you don't achieve the, the goal you want to achieve that affects your experience as well and this affects your behavior part of your behavior is rational that's the that's the dark green but most of it is is driven by 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 emotions and this means that the service provider not only has to have cognitive empathy but also effective or emotional empathy two words for the same thing effective or emotional empathy which is about identifying with the customer's feelings for instance um, uh, showing that you've understood what they've said offering an apology if that's appropriate those kind of things because that and that's that's the harder stuff really to learn but it's so important when you realize uh, how much uh, value people put on the on the experience that they have i'm doing some work on that uh, on this this area at the moment fascinating topic um, both forms effective effective and cognitive empathy both involve at listening observing attentively what's going on responding accordingly realizing that everybody is individual they have individual needs uh, for instance uh, somebody who is introvert will have different empathetic needs than somebody who is extrovert somebody who you're dealing with for the first time will possibly be a bit uncertain about the way of working so they might need some reassurance uh, 
So recognising all these differences and recognising that service interactions that happen between people, they are very subtle and very unpredictable social interactions. With lots of tiny little micro interactions that happen that you have to be constantly aware of and react to. And this means that it's very much about puzzle solving rather than the execution of scripts, standard scripts that you follow. Uh, you can learn it to a degree. There are techniques that you can learn, but you do have to have a degree of talent. Um, so some people are can, particularly the emotional side, um, emotional or effective empathy. You need uh, some people can do that more easily than other people. Now, the last two bullets, a couple of observations about uh, the relationship that the service provider, service consumer in, are in. Um, they, they both parties have conflicting interests in the sense that they're sort of fighting about resources. You know, the customer doesn't want to pay too much. The pro provider would like them to pay more. So they're negotiating about that. Um, at, at service desk, for instance, the service agent might be pressured to finish the call within a certain time, whereas the service um, consumer wants more information. So that could be a conflict. Yet at the same time, there's a common dependency on the service provider because the service agent depends on the provider for their employment and the service consumer depends on the provider for getting the job done. So there is something that, that connects them. And the final observation is that although the, um, the relationship is co-creational, both parties are working together to get something done, it's asymmetrical. Um, for instance, a consumer, a customer, is allowed to be, uh, to be angry about the transaction, about the, the interaction, uh, whereas that wouldn't be appropriate for the, uh, for the service provider. So there, is, there, are, there are differences. But it's a, it's a fascinating topic, empathy, and certainly one of the key points I think that you should, uh, you should be thinking about. Trust and be trusted. Except ambiguity and uncertainty, I'd like to give an example uh, to, to, to explore these, these two um, at the same time. Uh, typically in IT, we're comfortable with an if-then-else paradigm. It's either this or it's that, it's a zero or it's a one, usually what it boils down to. But life is increasingly, um, we recognize, if-then-maybe, there are lots of gray areas particularly when you're dealing with complex adaptive systems, the kind of systems that we are typically dealing with, where there are so many variables that you can't predict what will happen. So we have a complex system, and it, it's a fact that every complex system will have defects built into it. Whether we like it or not, there are intrinsic defects in the system, most of which are fairly self-contained in the sense that they either won't manifest themselves during the lifetime of the system, or when they do, the effect is small or you can deal with it quickly. But sometimes, from time to time, a number of inc incidents gang up on you and you get these inevitable things that happen that you have to deal with. The trouble is, because it's a complex system and you can't predict what's going to happen, you don't have a script how to deal with these things, so you need experienced people. But even then, the experienced people don't know exactly what caused it, so they have to take educated guesses, defensible gambles. They're taking a gamble on it. Now, if you're asking your people to take gambles on things, then you shouldn't blame them when things go wrong, because, that, you know, that's just part of the deal. So what you need is a degree of psychological safety in the workplace so people be, feel comfortable saying you know i think something's wrong so telling telling the boss bad news that's that's it if you if, we, if you work in a psychologically safe environment you're prepared to tell the boss bad news without fear of being blamed fear for your reputation or your position now this is so this is very much about uh, about the trust and being trusted and fortunately, in our industry, people are much more aware of the value of psychological safety uh, than, we, than we used, and stress prevention and stuff like that than we used to be. And this is based on an excellent paper by Dr. Richard Cook, 
he's a he's a medical guy but his his examples are equally applicable to our world uh, his so you find a PDF, this paper, pretty small paper, How Complex Systems Fail. Fabulous paper, recommended reading. Uh, a term I came across a while ago related to this topic is uh, epistemic humility. I thought that's such a great term, I must remember that. Uh, epistemic is about knowledge. So this is being humble about the knowledge that you have or don't have. And I try to do it in a two by two matrix. Uh, you've got stuff that's knowable and stuff that's unknowable. That's the lower layer and the upper layer. Um, some things are just pretty easy to understand, but some things are com complex and you can't understand them. They are intrinsically unknowable. And then you have people who believe that they know something and people that they don't, be don't believe, that they, they be believe that they don't know something. So if we start bottom left, uh, something is knowable and somebody believes that they know it. Well, if that's the case, then they can act on it. It's pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. If something is knowable, but they don't know enough about it, they can analyze, spend time on analyzing the situation and then acting when they've got enough information. Now, if a situation is unknowable, and somebody recognizes that they don't have enough information, you can't analyze it because you, you can't get the information. You simply have to experiment based on limited information, take a small step, see what happens, and then act based on that, taking the next step. So very much a very iterative, um, experimental way of working. The, the top right, this is the, um, this is the error that some people make. Uh, something is intrinsically unknowable, there's simply not enough information to, to act with certainty, but they think there's enough information. Well, that's when you, you have to brace for impact, as they say in, the, um, in an aircraft when you're crashing, because some, something's going to happen, you're mistaken. So the key point here is epistemic humility, that you realize that some things are simply unknowable and that you act accordingly more in an experimental way. Uh, than, uh, than thinking that you can make a plan and execute the plan. This is very much coherent with, uh, with DevOps thinking. The final point to develop, uh, doing the ethically right thing, really it's increasingly important. Uh, ethics ethics is, is serious shit, as you can see here. Uh, just think, for instance, about the fairly recent um, Boeing 737 MAX uh, aircraft tragedy where software played a key role. Um, you know, increasingly, lives, society, the economy depend on uh, depend on, on 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 information technology, and we are involved in those in the in the decision making. Um, for that book uh, I mentioned, I asked Dave Snowden, who you might know um, from his Kinefin framework. If you haven't come across the Kinefin framework, by the way, please take a look at it. It's extremely interesting, extremely relevant for work in the DevOps environment where you're dealing with complex adaptive systems. But I asked Dave to write a piece about ethics, and I'll try and sum up his five main points. He says, um, technology, as I just said, technology has an incre increasing impact on society and the economy. Our actions will always have unintended consequences, whether we like it or not. Uh, they can be positive, can be negative, but we can never predict exactly what's going to happen. Yet we are responsible, morally responsible as engineers, as practitioners for our actions, including the unintended consequences. That's a painful fact of life, but we have to have to confront ourselves with this. And therefore, organizations should monitor the behavior, ethical behavior in, 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 their, in their organization. Um, one of the, 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 I think the best sentence in Dave's piece was, uh, he said, just as organizations monitor the tr their cash flow, uh, they should also track the flow of virtue through the organization. I thought that was a great, great phrase, the flow of virtue through the organization. Are you doing the right thing? Now that led Dave to the conclusion that ethics belongs in the core of our education, 
not just as an add-on, but it re really should be a part of the, the core e education of engineers. Of course, it's not only about, uh, about ethics, it's also about the, the values that people have, their, their personal uh, values that have come from their upbringing and, and their, uh, their experience in, in society. But this is, uh, this is a really crucial, uh, crucial topic. Uh, Dave's a very clever guy. I'm, he's, he's, he's the guy who's influenced my, my thinking the most, I think, in my, uh, in my career. And uh, another thing that he came up with, um, which I'm quite keen to share because it's about people, about what managers in particular. So if you're a manager, be aware of these, these pitfalls, these heresies that you might be, might be guilty of. Um, and if you're not a manager, when you're dealing with managers, watch out that they're, they're possibly, possibly doing this kind of thing. Uh, the tendency to categorize things, to put things into boxes, it's either this or it's that, which can be useful um, just to discuss differences, but it's, it's, often, it's often a false, it's a false truth. They're not really in the, in the, in the one category, it's, it's a bit of a mix, and you should certainly watch, watch for boundary conditions between boxes where it's a bit of both, you've got a gray area. So watch out for people putting things into boxes. Uh, Manichaeism, uh, very strange word, even in the English, not, even as a native English speaker, I, I had not come across this word before, but it's about looking at things as if they have two opposing sides. It's either this or it's that. Um, what you can refer to as a false dichotomy. People say it's either this or it's that. It's usually not, it's usually a combination of both. It's just that there's a bit of this and a bit of that. So watch out for, for that, uh, making that contrast. Uh, homogeneity is something that, that managers often like to, uh, like to have in the organization, the sense that everything is the same, everything is standardized, uh, that people have the same kind of values, for instance, it's not sensible. Uh, it, even ethically dubious to impose values on people. But from a functional point of view, it's great if you have a certain kind of diversity in the organization, uh, coherent diversity. You don't want people arguing with each other all the time. But some kind of diversity is an excellent thing to have. KPIs, extremely dangerous. The moment that you make goals explicit, you destroy intrinsic motivation people start to game the system, which you don't want, and other stuff as well, which I'll, I'll, I'll skip for the sense of sake of time. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, there's, there are 10 minutes on the YouTube video that I've highlighted up the top, starting at 13 minutes, uh, where Dave talks about these topics. Intri very powerful stuff, uh, biases that, that managers often have and you, that you should be aware of and they should be aware of. So moving on to the, the final part, uh, the depressing part that you'll never master it anyway. It's, um, but there are some facts that, that could help you. I think the um, focusing on what you can control or influence is important. You might know these circles from Stephen Covey, uh, but they, they date back to, to the, the old, old Greeks, um, making the distinction between what uh, concerns you, such as corporate policy, that you are affected by, but you have no influence on. But recognize that that's just, just a fact of life. You'll have to live with that. Don't spend any energy trying to change stuff that you can't change. And recognize that there are things that you can change directly within your circle of control, and there, there are things that you can influence together with other people. That's quite an important concept. Now, this is something I came across ages ago, and I've used it all my career to think about the, the strong things, strong qualities that people have. Take an example. Say that you're flexible. Now, that could be a core quality. Um, what would be too much of flexible, flexibility? That could be that somebody's inconsistent, they're constantly changing, and that would be very confusing for people. So that would be too much of a good thing. Flexibility is good, inconsistency is not good. 
Now, the opposite of, it, opposite of being inconsistent is being organized. That sort of keeps that in check. What's the what's too much of a good thing? What is over organized? That leads to rigidity, uh, which is the opposite of flexibility. Now, Offman has given these these concepts names. He says this is a core quality. This is something that others appreciate in you. This is what, what why they like you. Something that you're good at. What you probably don't recognize yourself. You tend to play it down because it comes naturally to you. It's often something that you demand or expect from other people. That's your core quality. The pitfall is that you do too much of that. Um, people, people blame you for that. If you, if you take flex, flexibility to its excess, people will blame you for being inconsistent. And you often try and justify it in yourself and you can forgive it in other people because it's, it's sort of a natural quality that you, you recognize. The interesting thing is that you need a challenge. You need to be a bit more organized to balance that flexibility. So it's something that you lack in yourself, uh, but something that others wish that you would have more of. So that's something you should, um, you should think about. And a good way to identify your challenge is to think about your allergy. When you come across somebody's behavior, which you find extremely annoying, that's an allergy. It's something you despise in others, you'd hate it in yourself. And what other people say, you know, it's not that bad. It's just the way they are. But for you, it's an allergy. When you come across uh, an allergic reaction in yourself, realize that probably a little bit of that allergy is the challenge that, the, that you need to balance some core quality in yourself. Uh, this, I found this a fascinating way of looking at uh, people's qualities. You want to use people's strong points and help them develop those. Um, another example is, for instance, if somebody's helpful too much, the pitfall of helpful is interfering with people. The challenge is to let things happen, so take a step back a bit. Um, the allergy is somebody who is uncaring. You can imagine there are lots of... Uh, Lots of variations on this. Interesting thing, it did, I found this very helpful in, in my personal development. Now, you'll be familiar with, with Kanban as a, as a technique. Um, I came up with something that I've called the existential Kanban, not about to do, doing and done, but to be, being and been. And thinking about the kind of being, you know, being creative, being useful, being social, being healthy in the sense of uh, sustaining yourself, sustaining your organization, useful, being productive, being effective. These kind of qualities, and of course, being true to yourself. Now, in your career, um, in anything, in fact, you'll, you'll come across this, cur this curve of everything, whether it's people, whether it's organizations, whether it's products, they, they come and they go. Uh, but particularly when you're thinking about your career, you're, there, will be, there will come a point in your career where, when things start to go downhill. Then it's often too late to make a change. What you should do is change to a second curve when you're still... Uh, on the right side of the hill. So every, and that's a bit paradoxical, a bit counterintuitive because everything's going well and you sort of, you know, why would I change? But if you, you, you realize things are temporary, so make sure that you don't leave the change too late. That's something, uh, something you could think about as a bit of, uh, bit of career advice to, uh, to think about. So right, so we're at the end of the talk now. Um, how are you feeling? I hope you don't feel exhausted. I hope you feel positive about some of these thoughts that you can actually do something with them. So these were the topics that we dealt with. Life is a struggle, people are weird, behavior is unpredictable, you never master it anyway. And I'd like to leave you with, um, with my father's epitaph. Uh, which I think demonstrates that last point, you will never master it anyway. I was just getting the hang of it when the music stopped. And this is where the presentation stops. Thank you very much.